So uh, this was a difficult sermon to prepare. So let me pray. Mm. Father God, I just ask that you would uh, really, um, Lord, I've asked for the words. And I'm just asking, Lord, for the compassion that you had, that you shared these words with. Lord, I'm asking for your heart. Jesus, I want to be able to speak the way that you spoke. I want to be able to share the, the truths of your word in the same way that you shared them. With the compassion and the understanding and, uh, and just the love that transforms us. That brings us out of the gutter and, and sets us up as kings and queens in your glory. Thank you. Lord, I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I didn't realize how hard this passage was going to be until I got into it. Uh, I've kind of titled this Marriage and Calling, and really it's two, two separate sections, if you will. Marriage and Calling. Marriage and Calling. I'll get to Corinthians eventually. So it is with great trepidation that I seek to share these words from Yeshua and, and, and Saul, otherwise known as Paul. And although I cannot repent on behalf of all the evils that have been done because of misogyny or the hatred of women, I can repent at least for my part. I can also confess that the sins that have been committed by men against women are wicked and evil and have produced more pain and suffering than can be measured. Now, I realize that this teaching could stir up painful memories, but my hope is that this study will bring healing, forgiveness, restoration, and intimacy between each of us and between us and God. I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through 16 of chapter 7 in 1 Corinthians. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of much immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband fulfill his obligation to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have rights to her own body, but the husband. Likewise also the husband does not have rights to his own body, but the wife. Do not deprive one another except by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say as concession, not as command. Yet I wish that all men were like me. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this way and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with desire. But to the married I command, but not I, the Lord, a wife is not to separate from her husband. But if she gets separated, let her remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest... I, I say, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she agrees to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who is not a believer and he agrees to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy through the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy through her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if she, if the unbeliever separates, let him, se let him be separated. The brother or sister is not bound in such cases. But God has called you to shalom. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? <clears throat> so, uh, the first thing I'm going to go through is really the historical context and I realized by the time you know I take footnotes with all of my sermons and I post these online so you can get all the links of all the studies and the references where where I've gone to and you know you're 
you're leaning heavily on, on the work of other people when you get through a small paragraph like that and you're up to footnote number 12. <laughs> Not already. So let's go into the historical context. Firstly, it is important to understand that when Yeshua was here on earth, the status and therefore the value of women was extremely low. In the ancient Greek culture, Pandora, how many have heard of Pandora's box? Mm -hmm. So Pandora, the first woman, was responsible for unleashing evil in the world. And similar to Greek women, Roman women were not allowed to speak in public. The Roman law of marriage, cum manu, also placed the wife under the full legal control of her husband and prohibited her from ownership of any property. Now, the oral law of rabbinic Judaism also demeaned women by for forbidding a Torah scholar from conversing with a woman in the marketplace. He could not even talk with his wife, sister or daughter. And that by doing so, a man is doing evil to himself and inheriting hell. The sages said that a woman should not read the Torah out of respect for the congregation. And Rabbi Eliezer said that whoever teaches his daughter the Torah is considered as if he taught her foolishness. And that was the nicest translation I found. Josephus mentions that a woman's testimony was not valid in a court setting at that time. And this is very important for the rest of the study. Only men were allowed to get a divorce, and that for any reason at all, even for burning the toast, apparently. <laughs> so into this world comes Yeshua. Now, Yeshua loved women and treated them with a great respect and dignity. He conversed with them publicly, and he entrusted the greatest news of all time, his own resurrection, to the testimony of women. Shaul follows Yeshua's lead in elevating the status and the value of women to the equivalence of men. So in this chapter, we're going to go into the chapter now. In this chapter, Shaul res re is responding to the congregation in Corinth. They've obviously asked him a question about this, and he responds with what he believes is the better option, which is celibacy. And he contrasts this option with an acceptable option, which is marriage. So he's wrestling between those two options. Now, it's very clear that he shows that the gift of celibacy is not a gift that is given to everyone. He mentions that in verse 7. It's only to those who it's been given. And last week, I kind of, tongue-in-cheek, in a joking manner, I, I mentioned verse 1. Somebody asked, to what extent could a relationship go before marriage? And I said, oh, that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. <laughs> you know? And while that's it's tongue in cheek and it's quoting this passage, um, this, uh, this phrase in Greek is actually used um, elsewhere in other Greek literature. And uh, it occurs about nine other times. And in every case, uh, it actually denotes the specific act of sexual intercourse. So do not touch a woman. Now, Shaul is not acknowledging that biblically ordained marriage is a beachhead against sexual immorality. It stops that. Now, remember how last week we discussed Gnostic teachings? For those of you who weren't here last week, uh, there's a, I put it as a real small clip on YouTube so you can find me. By the way, if you need to find the YouTube channel, look up Robert Miles Yeshua. If you put those three in, you'll find me. Otherwise, you'll find out that I'm a famous pop star in Europe somewhere. <laughs> Been around apparently for longer than I've been alive. Got to tell well, yeah, sorry <laughs> for telling, not telling anybody. If you look me up, you know, you will. It's kind of nice to be overshadowed in some circumstances. But there's a large teaching that we did on Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism, one of the directions that the Gnostic teach teachings lead is towards asceticism or complete denial of all your, your desires, in particular with regards to food and sexuality. So Greek philosophical, philosophical dualism is what, the, the under, what it was called at the time. It led people to believe that, quote, only when a person lives in the realm of the spirit as exclusively as possible is he or she 
truly pleasing to God. Remember, it was a complete denial of the physical realm. So here Shaul counters that belief by showing that sexual relations are an obligation and a right both of the husband and of the, and of the wife. And although there can be a brief time of abstinence within marriage for prayer, there is no place for a permanent or a non-mutual abstinence within marriage. It's very important to also note that Shaul consistently applies it to the husband and to the wife. You'll see what he says about the husband, he says about the wife. That may not, that's not a big deal, I think, in our culture. We, we kind of have come to assume that. But at that time, this was raising the status of women to complete equivalence to that of men. Mm. Completely equal. <clears throat> And in other letters, for instance, Ephesians chapter 5 or Colossians chapter 3, Shaul is even stricter with men as to their responsibilities towards their wives than he is about the wives and their responsibilities to the, to the men. And all of these teachings, of course, were coming to counter the culture that had degraded women so much. So what did the world look like for a woman living in the first century? Well, it's actually not that hard to imagine. We can actually look at any nation in the world where Christianity is not a majority. Let's take Islamic nations as an example. In the Quran, Surah, Surah chapter 4, verses 34, it says that since men are the protectors and the maintainers of women, if a woman demonstrates ill conduct, that men should first admonish, then refuse to share their beds, and at last beat them. And this is not much different from the Greco-Roman world in, into which Saul is writing. It's very similar to, to what was going on. Now, as mentioned before, celibacy is Shaul's preferred option. He thinks that's, he thinks that that's a, a great option, uh, but he also understands that it's not a requirement. He's very deliberate in showing that it's an option. You'll notice how many times he repeats himself saying, this is my opinion. This is me talking, not the Lord. He's trying to emphasize the fact that this is, this is not a biblical mandate. He then applies this recommendation in verses 8 and 9 from those who are unmarried and widows as well. So in verse 8 and 9 he says, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them to remain as I am. But it's okay also to get married. And later in the passage, in verses 25 through 35, which we'll talk about, uh, there's actually a reason. He gives the reasoning for why he believes that celibacy is the better option. But he also has the understanding that one of the main purposes of marriage is so that we can find sexual fulfillment in a God-glorifying context. Now, Shaul often, you know, he then actually quotes straight from Yeshua. When he says in verse, uh, in verse 10, But to the married I command, not I but the Lord. Uh, I think a lot of you may have footnotes there, and it's pointing back to Matthew 5 verse 32 and Matthew 19 verse 9. Also in Mark, Mark's gospel uh, in chapter 10 verses 5 through 9. And he says, A wife is not to be separated from her husband. But if she gets separated, let her remain unmarried, or else let her be reconciled to her husband. And the husband is not to divorce his wife. Now, Shaul is on firm grounds by quoting Yeshua. And at the same time, he is acknowledging the brokenness of mankind by saying, if. He gives that contingency. This entire chapter should be seen as an application of Yeshua's teaching what Yeshua had taught. Now, Yeshua never lowered the standards for us, but instead, He reached down and raised us up by His grace, and He provides us a way for atonement and forgiveness. The marriage covenant is supposed to reflect the covenant between God and His people. However, none of us measure up. We are all scarred and broken. And each one of us desperately needs Yeshua's blood to wash us clean from sin and also to heal 
our broken hearts. Now Shaul goes into a discussion in verses 12 through 15 about marriages where only one person has come to faith in, in the Messiah Yeshua after they were married. Now these verses do not apply to what we colloquially call missionary dating. How many have heard of missionary dating? Yeah. No, everybody's shaking their head. It must be an Americanism. So missionary dating is where a young believer will date an unbeliever in the hopes that they will come to Messiah. Okay? I don't know if you have another way of, what of calling it, but we call it missionary dating. Dating with the hope that they will come to know Jesus. Hmm? Entrapment. <laughs> yeah. Well, it says not to, right? This is not referring to that. But this is actually for those who find themselves in this place where they've come to a saving knowledge of the Lord and their spouse does not. And if you find yourself in this place, do not seek a divorce. Your life's example of Yeshua will be the closest thing that your unbelieving husband or wife will ever see. And as the Ruach makes you holy and sanctifies you, takes you through that process, it will be a living testimony of the power of God. Now, Shaul acknowledges that there's many times when the unbeliever will separate from the believer. They'll say, that's not what I bargained for, um, and I'll just leave. And in these cases, since we are called to shalom or peace, we should let them go. Remaining as we're called. So moving on to the rest of the chapter, I'm going to read verses 17 through 40. And we'll discuss the rest of the chapter. And there will be time at the end for some questions. So verse 17. Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, let him walk in this way. Now I give this rule in all of Messiah's communities. Was anyone called when he was already circumcised? Let him not make himself uncircumcised. Has anyone been called while uncircumcised? Let him, let him not allow himself to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping God's commandments matters. Now let one remain in the calling in which he was called. Were you called as a slave? Do not let that bother you. But if indeed you can become free, make the most of that opportunity. For the one who was called in the Lord as a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, the one who is called while free is Messiah's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers and sisters, let each one, in whatever way he was called, remain in that way. Now considering virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give as an opinion one by whom the Lord's mercy is trustworthy, as one who by whom the Lord's mercy is tr trustworthy. I think that because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek a divorce. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. If a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such people will have trouble in this fleshly life. And I am trying to spare you. But this I say, brothers and sisters, the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though not weeping, and those who rejoice as though not rejoicing, and those who buy as though not possessing, and those who use this world as though not using it to the fullest, for the present form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be free from cares. An unmarried man cares about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but the married man cares about the things of the world how he may please his wife, and he is divided. The unmarried woman, as well as the virgin, cares about the things of the Lord, so that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But the married woman cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now I say this for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote proper and constant service to the Lord without distraction. But if any man thinks that he is behaving inappropriately towards his virgin, if the time is ripe and it is meant to be, let him do what he decides. He does not sin. Let them marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, who has no pressure but has power over his own will, and is so determined in his own heart to keep her a virgin, he will do well. 
So then, both he who marries the virgin does well, and he who does not marry her does better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married any to anyone she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I also think that I have the Ruach Elohim. Remaining as we are called. Nashul is very clear throughout his ministry that there are no external requirements for following Yeshua. So this argument about circumcision, uncircumcision, you'll see that throughout all of the book of Acts. Acts 15 is all about that. This, is, this was a massive uh, ministry that Shaul had towards the Gentiles. And he, he had this calling, and he shared that calling with, with Peter, James, and John, and they agreed that his <coughs> teaching was right. So here he tells the congregation in Corinth that they are not unique in receiving this same teaching. Rather, Shaul continuously declares that however Yeshua called us, in that way we should remain. There's no requirement that the uncircumcised become circumcised like the Judaizers were trying to do, or that the circumcised become uncircumcised like the Hellenizers were trying to do. Shaul then goes on to show that there's also no requirement to change our social status. You know, external slavery does not constrain or define who we are in Messiah. But by the same token, our freedom and wealth does not make us better than those who are more impoverished than ourselves. Rather, we should realize that we are the slaves of Messiah and we are called to serve him. So here Shaul applies the principle of remaining as we are to marriage. So in verses 25 through 31, he takes that same principle and says, you know, here's my opinion. It's not a requirement, but as we mentioned before, you know, here are the reasons for celibacy. And Shaul goes into his reasons for celibacy. He, he mentions that it's a troubling time. Now this word trouble uh, usually refers to personal suffering or persecution. Now, it, he could have been referring to, uh, if you remember, the riots that had been happening in Thessalonica beforehand. So a, a couple of years before, or a year before he got to Corinth, he had just been expelled from Thessalonica due to the riots. And it could have been that those riots had followed him and were now in Thessalonica against the believers. So it could have been that sort of persecution, or it could have been something else. Shaul states that he's trying to spare people from trouble, and, you know, in this life, and that, uh, that marriage brings a new level of trouble to our lives. But regardless whether or not we're married or unmarried, we must devote our lives to the Lord because time is short. There seems to be a reference here to the end of time as well, that time is short. And if it was short then, I say, how much shorter is it today? Time is short. Our lives do not consist of the material wealth and possessions, nor do they consist of our children and our spouses. Rather, we must glorify God now, since this world <laughs> is now passing away. We need to glorify God. Now, when we are married, as, as those who've been married know, uh, our focus cannot be entirely on the Lord. Rather, uh, it takes a lot of time to invest in both children and in spouses. So it takes a lot of time. And you know, he says, look, I, I'm trying to encourage this continuous service to the Lord. And when you're married, you do, you have to take time to invest in your spouse and in your children. It's part of the responsibilities of being married. And it's, you know, it can be the blessing too, but it takes work. I think everybody's looking at me, nodding their heads. It takes work. But the Lord understands this. And in, in Isaiah, he says, that like a shepherd, he tends his flocks and he gathers his lambs in his arms and carries them in his bosom and he guides nursing ewes gently. This is repeated again when Yeshua refers to himself and as the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd who will tend the sheep. The Lord leads those gently who have children. And so whether we are married or unmarried, we can serve the Lord. However, Shaul is simply explaining that the unmarried will have fewer cares and concerns. Now, I don't know if some of you caught it in verse 36 and, and in some of this passage, there's a little bit of the wording that sounds a little strange. There's a little bit that um, can get a little confusing. 
and talks about is he behave he behaving inappropriately to his virgin and then he says let them marry there's this there's this little back and forth but part of that confusion if you remember at that time almost all marriages were arranged and so here it would seem that that Paul is talking to the uh, to the fathers or, and you're know, arranging marriages for their daughters and saying look if you're fully convinced that's okay if you're not going to marry your daughters off that's okay but if you're you know if you know there's there's obviously an attraction between her and someone else and it's coming that time of age you haven't sinned let her be married and um, and so there's this little back and forth so that's part of just how the words are phrased but there is one caveat um, of course and it is that that they the spouse would be in the Lord and that is repeated again in 2nd Corinthians because obviously they probably didn't remember him saying it in 1st Corinthians so they didn't apply it so he had to rewrite it in, in the, the next letter and that's where he starts talking about not being unequally yoked with unbelievers it is it is very very difficult to be in a, in a relationship where you're the you are a believer and your spouse is not you know I, there is one thing I want to note about Shoals, um, how the way he phrases things and the way he, he really has shown his opinion versus what he believes is commandment. And he's really clear about that. You know, he, he gives his advice, but he says, look, this is just advice. And I think that he makes it so clear it's his opinion, but not a command. And we should take care to treat our own opinions, not as commands from God especially but we also need to need to be careful not to take God's commands as opinions so there's a balance there now you know in the last couple of verses in verse 39 he's really repeating what Yeshua said he says a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives but if her husband dies she is free to be married to anyone she wishes only in the Lord but of course he can't help himself he wants to share his opinion one more time and finishes out by saying yes but I recommend celibacy as the better option so in conclusion with regards to marriage the Lord is calling us to walk in his ways which are higher than our ways and he he always brings us to a place of repentance so that there might be forgiveness and healing he empowers us through the Ruach HaKodesh to live lives that reflect his glory. You know, Shaul contrasts his opinion on, on celibacy versus the biblical definition of marriage. Which as Yeshua said in quoting Genesis 2, is one man and one woman for life. Now both celibacy and marriage are acceptable. But Shaul believes that cel celibacy will bring fewer hardships especially in times of persecution. Now he clearly enunciates his preference, but he also acknowledges that marriage can bring glory to God. So whether we are single or married, may our lives bring glory to God.